Welcome to Viewer's Choice. In Australia. It was amazing to see host Mark Carpentier meeting, interacting, and playing with the Asimov robot and witnessing its amazing skills. I enjoyed the program and look forward to owning my own personal Asimov one day. Thank you, and here's the show. Meet the machine that walks and talks like a human. Asimo is considered the world's most advanced humanoid robot. It's nice to meet you. I'm Asimo. Asimo came to this world in November 2000. The company behind its development is Japanese automaker Honda. Asimo's ability to walk captured the world's imagination. Hey, good job. The robot is improving every year. The latest version is capable of running at a speed of nine kilometers per hour. It can leap off the ground without losing its balance. Its leg movements reveal a complex set of hip, knee, and ankle joints. Asimo's 10 fingers are fully flexible. Honda began developing humanoid robots in 1986. The project was kept completely secret for several years. I thought it would be interesting to build a robot that looks like me, a sort of alter ego with similar abilities. To achieve that goal, engineers had to overcome difficult challenges. A one centimeter high obstacle was enough to topple the first experimental models. Honda's engineers took up these challenges one by one to produce a fully functional humanoid robot. Asimo also boasts an advanced artificial intelligence. Asimo's brain can process and respond to requests from several people simultaneously. The actions seen here are not remote controlled. The robot processes data and determines its own course of action. We want Asimo to be a game changer. Robots are designed to serve a purpose. In this edition of JTEC, we explore Honda's efforts to stretch the limits of humanoid robot technology. Hello, I'm Marc Carpentier. Welcome to the program. In this edition of JTEC, we're going to take you to the boundaries of our imagination, where fiction becomes reality. Our insatiable curiosity and boundless creativity have spawned incredible tales set in the future in fantastical technological worlds that are the realm of science fiction. Often these stories are premonitions of what our world will become. Jules Verne imagined that we would go to the moon and explore the depths of our oceans a hundred years before we actually did. One other such writer was Carol Tsepik, who was the first to use the word robot in a play he published in 1920. In the Czech language, robot literally means forced labor. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines the word robot as an automatically operated machine that replaces human effort. Today, robots are no longer science fiction. They permeate our daily lives. A major Japanese mobile phone company, for instance, recently commercialized a robot that can converse with humans. Japanese robot technology took off in the 1970s, centered on industrial applications. 
They now replace the human hand to perform fine, complex operations with speed and accuracy. But the development of walking robots failed to make any progress because of their complexity. In 1986, automaker Honda embarked on a project to develop a humanoid robot. Here's a sketch by the project leader at the time. He envisioned a robot that could assist people in their everyday lives. This concept remains central in the development of ASIMO. Follow me as we discover how ASIMO's technology was developed, its latest advances, and its future applications. Our personal appointment with ASIMO takes place at Honda's headquarters in Tokyo. Hello, ASIMO. Welcome, Mark. It's nice to meet you. I'm ASIMO. Nice to meet you, too. I am deal like to introduce myself with sign language. My name is Asimo. Well done. Pleased to see you. Pleased to see you too. Can I shake your hand? Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Please come this way. Thank you. Let me follow you. Asimo has been programmed to walk slowly when guiding people. Let's play soccer. I'd love to play soccer with you. By the way, you also played soccer with Barack Obama, didn't you? <laughs> Shall I place the ball for you? There you go. Now I'll go over here and wait for your kick. Okay. Here I go. Oh, nice kick, Asimo. <laughs> Asimo, let's do this again. This time, I'm going to put the ball in a different place. Okay, Asimo, anytime you're ready. Asimo determines the ideal position from where to kick the ball. Here I go. Wow, you knew exactly where the ball was. Next, I run. You run. Wow, please show me how you do that, too. It runs fast, and it keeps its balance. Next, Asimo demonstrates its ability to jump on one foot. Its hip, knee, and ankle joints work together to perfectly absorb the impact of every jump. Asimo can also remain perfectly balanced on one leg. Meeting Asimo was a fun experience. I was surprised at how easy it is to develop an emotional response to it. When a machine speaks to you in a human voice, plays ball with you, and is giddy when showing you the new tricks it's learned, it strikes a sympathetic chord. I couldn't help but calling it a he. I could have called it a she, but its programmed voice is that of a teenage boy. Asimo is able to move around and interact autonomously because of its computer brain. Its actions in Honda's showroom, though, were all pre-programmed and triggered by remote control. Its artificial intelligence is still in development and is a highly guarded company secret. Asimo will eventually be able to learn and adapt to its environment all on its own. It will be so advanced that Honda engineers are reluctant to discuss that technology. Right now, ASIMO has to be programmed to function within specific environments. 
So engineers turned off some of Asimo's sensors when we were filming to avoid automatic shutdowns caused by the erratic movements of our crew. Let's go back to Honda now for a closer look at the technologies that make Asimo do what it does. The Basic Technology Research Center is located on the outskirts of Tokyo. It's a subsidiary of the company's R&D division. Honda develops new technologies here. It's also where Asimo was born. Cameras are rarely allowed inside. What goes on behind these doors is top secret. Even the center's staff and annual budget are classified. The people who work here are all experts, carefully selected among Honda's best engineers. Day in and day out, they keep improving Asimo and pushing the limits of what they can achieve. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Satoshi Shigemi, project leader of Asimo. Satoshi Shigemi has played a key role in the development of Asimo. How is it that you are able to make Asimo leap in the air, keep his balance, and, and hit the ground running as we do? When Asimo runs, both of its feet leave the ground at the same time. The difficulty here is to maintain its balance in the air. When the back foot moves forward, the motion causes the body to spin like this. To compensate for this force, the upper body has to rotate in the opposite direction, like this. When the back foot comes forward, the body is thrown around like this. The response is to use the hip and twist the upper body like this. As a result, the spin and the rotation cancel each other out and the body stays straight. Otherwise, the robot would walk like this. This action of Asimo running was shot with a high-speed camera. Every time it thrusts a leg forward, its entire body is subject to a spinning force. At that precise moment, Asimo rotates its hips and orients its torso slightly towards the leg. That's enough to absorb the force of the spin and to keep it facing forward. At the same time, Asimo is tilting its body back and forth to maintain its balance. The aim of this motion is to keep its center of gravity aligned with the foot that's on the ground. This also allows for better shock absorption. The combination of lateral rotation and back and forth tilting of the upper body is what allows Asimo to run like a human. Are you using gyroscopes? Mm. Yes. Asimo's hips are fitted with a gravity gyro sensor. It measures the body's degree of inclination. The soles of its feet are also equipped with force and momentum sensors. The role of these sensors is to measure the forces acting on the feet and determine their direction. When running, Asimo analyzes in real time the data from the gyro and the force and momentum sensors and positions its body accordingly to stay balanced. All that computing is the engineering equivalent of what happens in our brains when we run. There's a lot more humanness than the simple mechanics, the mobility uh, feature of Asimo. It's interactivity also. So it's able to interact with people that come into uh, his space. And so how is that done? Howdy. Well, in order to coexist with humans, it's important to be able to communicate with them. That means recognizing who is there and what that person wants. Asimo has to be able to predict these interactions. Hello, Asimo. Welcome, Mark. Asimo is fitted with cameras. The data has to be put into the system beforehand, and Asimo's facial recognition program recognizes you as Mark. 
Two CCD cameras serve as Asimo's eyes. When it encounters someone, the robot analyzes the visual data and isolates the human body from the rest of the environment. Information such as the color of the skin and the distance between the eyes are checked against the onboard database, allowing Asimo to recognize a person's identity. Asimo. Once a person is identified, Asimo follows the verbal command and responds to hand gestures. The position of the hand is marked here in blue. When the hand points left or right, the robot interprets the gesture as an order and moves in that direction. How many sensors are there in ASIMO? Hi, ASIMO, uh, ASIMO is fitted with quite a few sensors to understand its environment. In total, there are 25 sensors, including the cameras and the force and momentum sensors. It's difficult to see them because they're very small, but the head has eight microphones. There's also a camera here. It tracks marks and other things on the ground. What we're aiming for is a robot that can react to changes in its environment. We've reached a point where it's not just one sensor triggering a given response, but a combination of sensors, allowing Asimo to choose the ideal course of action among several actions. The ultimate objective of the Asimo project is to build a robot that can coexist with humans in their everyday environment. Achieving this goal will require much more advanced capabilities. When Soichiro Honda founded the Honda Motor Company in 1948, he had no idea he would one day be making robots. He first set out to manufacture motor-assisted bicycles and went on to become the world's largest manufacturer of motorcycles. Honda Motor made its name after scoring well at the Isle of Man TT in 1959. It then ventured into the automobile industry. Honda's first mass-produced auto was actually a pickup truck called the T360, released in 1963. It also developed a race car and won the Formula One Grand Prix in 1965. Honda then gained global attention with its CVCC engine, the first engine in the world to meet the tough emissions control standards of the Clean Air Act, passed in 1970 by the United States federal government. As a result, Honda's cars became very popular. In its first 38 years, Honda had proved its success, but it knew that the key to the future depended on innovation. Honda's Basic Technology Research Center was established with the aim of developing automotive electronics, new materials, and robotics. It brings together some of the auto industry's best engineers. Katsutoshi Tagami was the center's first director. He had been with the company for 25 years and spearheaded the development of the world's first car navigation system. Assigning me to research electronics and new materials wasn't enough to boost the company. I had to ponder what kind of basic technology Honda needed to develop to take the idea of mobility to the next level. Tagami singled out four fields of research, ultralight cars, self-driving vehicles, aircraft, and humanoid robots. He envisioned the cars of the future and took the concept of mobility beyond the automobile. I thought it would be interesting to build a robot that looks like me, a sort of alter ego with similar abilities. Tagami imagined a robot that could, for example, travel somewhere, say, climb a mountain, and then come back and share the experience. He thought the concept of mobility should apply not only to our physical bodies, but also to our minds. When it started developing a robot in 1986, Honda was entering unknown territory. It assigned just three engineers to the project. 
they first got to work on a two-legged experimental model. One of the team members drew up a blueprint based on his own legs. Three months later, they completed their first model, E0. Its structure was rudimentary. It had nothing more than motors operating the hip, knee, and ankle joints. The machine advanced one very slow step at a time. It took 10 agonizing seconds for it to put one foot ahead of the other. Engineers tried increasing the power output, but the fastest they could get it to walk was five seconds per step. This graphic shows how E0 shifted its center of gravity. It stopped after each step while transferring all of its weight from one foot to the other in a linear fashion. The machine behaved like a human does when walking on ice. This slow, careful movement is called static walking. A normal stride involves constant forward movement of the body, keeping one center of gravity closer to the center. This is called dynamic walking. The engineers now knew this is how the robot would have to walk. So they conducted a thorough survey to better understand the principles of walking. They began by filming themselves walking with their arms locked to their sides and studying the movements of the leg muscles and joints. They also visited the zoo to compare their findings with the way animals walk. They found that humans use their toes to keep balanced upright. Replicating toes on a robot would be very difficult. They wanted to keep the systems as simple as possible. The engineers paid a visit to a nearby physical rehabilitation center. They wondered how people with disabilities were able to teach themselves how to walk again. We met a man who had lost his toes in a mountain climbing accident. Our team interviewed several people, and we were told it was possible to walk without toes. So we thought, okay, since toes are very complex and difficult to replicate, let's try and build a robot without them. This realization and other results of the survey led to the development of E1. This machine was built with what the team saw as the strict minimum number of components to replicate dynamic walking. Like its predecessor E0, this model was also designed without toes on its feet. The ankles were equipped with two motors each for forward and lateral movement. The knees had only one motor to flex the legs vertically. The hips were fitted with three motors on either side to allow forward and lateral movement, as well as rotation along the vertical axis. The upper part of the robot housed circuit boards to independently activate each motor. Orders came from an external computer connected to the machine. Now, the engineers had to figure out how to coordinate the action of each one of the motors to replicate the complexity of dynamic walking. They studied how the leg joints move in relation to each other while walking. Tiny light bulbs were attached to a person's hip, knees, ankles, and toes, and their motion was recorded on tape. Time-lapse analysis of the motion of each light provided valuable clues. From top to bottom are the hip, the knee, the ankle, and the toes. An overhead view shows the motion of each articulation along the axis of progression. All this data was fed into the computer used to operate E1. The engineers permutated the data to see how it affected the robotic legs. They also tried different types of motors and bearings. Step by step, 
these studies served to improve their experimental model. The result was E2, a prototype capable of walking at a speed of 1.2 kilometers per hour. By 1991, the team more than doubled that speed with E3. Honda's robot project was now in its fifth year. The team had made steady progress, but it now faced another daunting challenge. E3 could only walk on a perfectly flat surface. A jut in the floor of only one centimeter caused the machine to stumble and lose its balance. When the robot walks, its motion is influenced by two fundamental factors, gravity and acceleration or deceleration. The combination of these two factors is called the total inertial force. Every time the robot puts its foot down, that leg is subject to what is called the ground reaction force. As long as these two forces are aligned, they cancel each other out and the robot remains stable. When the robot steps on an uneven surface, the ground reaction force and the total inertial force are misaligned, causing the machine to be thrown off balance. The man in charge of solving this problem was Toru Takenaka, an expert in mechanical control who had worked for a venture that developed robots. They showed me the robot the very day I joined the company. I was amazed at how stable it was when it walked. This is the model I saw. It walked at a speed of 1.2 kilometers per hour. I soon understood that the impact of each step was so great that it threw the whole machine off balance. The robot's feet were made of rigid metal. Unlike those of a human, they had no toes for balance and no cushioning to absorb the impact of a step. That's why an uneven surface or a small gradient had big consequences on the robot's sense of balance. Takenaka decided to fit the next model with rubber shock absorbers. He carried out several trials to identify their ideal shape and elasticity. We concluded that cylindrical pieces of rubber might be the best strategy, and the result provided the basis for the feet of the E4. The shock absorbers are right under the screws here. There are four rubber cylinders like this one. The rubber cylinders fitted under the feet wouldn't be enough to absorb the shock of a step. So engineers covered the soles with two layers of rubber, one spongy and the other textured. This would offer extra cushioning on uneven ground. Takenaka also fitted the new model with a gyro sensor to detect tilting motion and sensors in the feet to measure the forces and momentum and the sensations experienced by human feet and toes. These became the main components of Honda's first robot control system. The idea was to balance the robot by rotating its ankles. In the end, the concept was like standing on a seesaw and tilting it back and forth. For example, if the robot were about to fall forward, it would readjust its balance as if to push down the front part of the board. This self-balancing motion involved moving the hips, the knees, and the ankles all at once. A careful examination in slow motion, treating the surface of the seesaw as the ground, shows how all the joints work together to maintain balance. When this data is fed into the robot's control system, the response to stepping over an uneven surface was no longer limited to flexing just the ankle. It called for the coordination of all articulations in both legs. The machine could then take another step without losing its balance. Takenaka and his team mounted a new control system onto the robot. E4's new shock absorbers and motion control technology made it visibly more stable. The 
one centimeter jut that used to throw it off balance was no longer a threat. But total stability remained elusive. Takenaka's solution only worked with differences in juts or obstacles of up to four centimeters, and the robot remained vulnerable to external impact. All the robot could rely on to balance itself was its legs, but there was a limit to what it could achieve. If we look at how we humans react when we're thrown off balance, we end up stepping outwards with one of our feet. Replicating that motion became my new objective. What Takenaka is referring to can be seen in the way gymnasts control a difficult landing. Instead of absorbing the full shock by flexing her joints, the gymnast steps back and braces firmly to catch her balance. Here's what it looks like in a front handspring. In slow motion, we can see that the momentum from the rotation leads the gymnast to take an extra step to catch his balance. Another important factor is that as he takes that step, the gymnast also brings his hips forward to control his center of gravity. While the hip accelerates forward, the upper body straightens up and tilts backwards that's how we regain balance. When the robot is thrown off balance after stepping on an obstacle, it's made to continue its motion instead of resisting it. The upper body is tilted in the opposite direction, and balance is gradually regained as the machine continues stepping forward. The methods worked out by Takenaka to control the robot's motion were revolutionary. The improved technology was mounted onto a new model called the E6. The team experimented with walking up and down a slope and making the robot take wider steps over obstacles as high as four centimeters. The machine could also walk up and down stairs, all without losing its balance they had managed to produce a robot that could move around in a human environment. Honda's engineers had finally overcome their most difficult challenge, developing bipedal technology. Now that their robot could walk, they needed to add an upper body to those legs. The company's first full-body humanoid robot was the P1. It was so huge, engineers nicknamed it the Monster. The first prototype was called the P1. It combined the legs of the E6 with an upper body engineers had developed separately. It had two cameras acting as its eyes and arms fitted with retractable claws. The P1 was 191 and a half centimeters tall and weighed a hefty 175 kilos. Its rather primitive arms allowed it to grab a handle and open or close a door. It could also lift and displace objects. The P1 was fitted with the components necessary to operate the arms and legs, but the power source and the computer unit were not yet on board. Two years later in 1995, the improved P2 prototype took its first steps outside the laboratory. It was able to climb up and down stairs and walk around the corridors. Soon after that successful demonstration, the director of the research center got wind of some unexpected developments outside Honda. I read an article saying the Ministry of International Trade and Industry was launching a large-scale project to develop humanoid robots. It was calling on private corporations to join the project. The goal was to produce a robot within two years. And I started wondering if we could afford to keep our own project under wraps. So I talked it over with our CEO. MITI, as the ministry was called back then, was planning to fund the project over a five-year period. 
Honda informed the government of what it was doing. Up until then, the company's robot development project had been kept secret. We didn't show them our prototype right away. We showed them our videos with the robot climbing stairs smoothly, and they were really surprised. They said they didn't expect an automaker to be working on this kind of thing. They were really thrilled and begged Honda to get on board. Honda agreed to join the project, and on December 20th, 1996, it unveiled P2 for the first time. P2 was a behemoth, standing 182 centimeters tall and weighing no less than 210 kilos. The power unit and computer were on board, making it the world's first fully autonomous two-legged robot. When it ran into a table or a chair, it stopped, computed a new course, and started walking again. P2 could also push a loaded cart. If a person stopped the cart, the machine stopped advancing. Its operating system was designed to prevent any injuries, based on the principle of coexistence with humans. Since the foundation of Honda's Basic Technology Research Center, it took company engineers 15 years to develop a humanoid robot fit for the home. They were 15 years of trial and error, of creating new technologies, experimenting with sensors, actuators, and computers, and producing 10 prototypes before they could release their dream child to the world. Asimo was born on November 20th in the year 2000. Asimo was an instant success with the public. The Japanese people were amused by its name. They thought of it as a play on the words ashi meaning legs and mo for mobility. It was a lot smaller than its predecessors. It stood 1.2 meters tall and weighed 43 kilograms, about the size and weight of a 10-year-old boy. It actually is a lot smaller than I expected. So why is it? I guess there is a reason why he is the size he is. We decided on this size because we wanted to create a robot that could prove useful in people's homes. It had to be about the size of an elementary school student and could help out as a service robot. We hope to have one Asimo in every house as a member of the family. At the start of the project, engineers imagined a robot in humanoid form helping people in the home. Asimo is the realization of that early vision. A height of 1.2 meters is enough for the robot to operate various household switches and utensils, as well as office equipment such as computers and copiers. In comparison to P2, the world's first ever bipedal robot, Asimo, has only two-thirds the height and one-fifth the weight. The developers work to make Asimo's body and external skin out of the lightest possible materials, while also harnessing the latest technology to make Asimo's circuits and motors as compact as possible. But Asimo's biggest advance over previous robots is his walking ability. Compared to the P2, Asimo's movements are far smoother. In order to change direction, P2 had to stop and turn little by little while pacing on the spot. But Asimo can change direction without slowing down. To ensure he doesn't fall over, Asimo can predict his own movements three steps in advance and keep his balance based on these predictive assessments. That's why he's able to turn and change his walking patterns at any time. As it moves, Asimo predicts its future movements in real time, adjusting its stride and rhythm as it walks. For example, when running along a slalom path, Asimo knows how far its center of gravity will shift towards the outside of the curve and compensates by tilting its body towards the inside. These algorithms produce smooth, realistic movements.
Alongside its improved walking ability, Asimo is also demonstrating advances in other areas. Programs have been developed to make use of the visual and auditory data from Asimo's many cameras and microphones. Developers say that Asimo is able to recognize several faces and voices simultaneously. <laughs> Through repeated cycles of failure and success, engineers finally got it right. Asimo's fingers have also become more sophisticated. Human beings make very sensitive movements with their fingers and use them more frequently than any other part of their body. If Asimo learns to move its fingers more like a human, it will likely become more useful in a wider variety of daily interactions. These fingers are from the 2011 model of Asimo. Each hand has a total of 13 joints. The first version of Asimo had only a single joint on each thumb. The second version of Asimo from 2005 had two joints on each thumb, but this meant it could make only simple grasping and releasing movements. Asimo's other four fingers were too thin to accommodate a motor, and for many years no improvements were made. However, the last version of Asimo makes use of a hydraulic system usually used for applications such as vehicle brakes. The motors for operating the 13 finger joints are not within the fingers, but inside Asimo's chest. The hydraulics link the motors to the fingers and act much like muscles. Originally, many on the development team were opposed to such a system. In the past, they'd had problems with damage caused by leaking hydraulic fluid. A lot of people told us to stay away from hydraulic systems. <laughs> the team made prototype hydraulic tubes from various materials before choosing one that would not affect the arm or shoulder movements. They were also careful with how they arranged the tubes. The hydraulic system dramatically improves the power of Asimo's grip. The developers also attached sensors to each of Asimo's fingertips. The sensors enable Asimo to assess the shape and resilience of an object and adjust the position of its fingers and the strength of its grip accordingly. For example, when holding a flask of water, Asimo uses the information from all sensors in its five fingers to take a firm grip. It then uses its left hand to take off the lid and pour liquid into a cup. Asimo can also sense how much liquid to pour, depending on the weight and shape of the cup. If something seems impossible, we try to persevere and make progress by actually building things. The first model of Asimo was unveiled 14 years ago. To this day, Honda's engineers have continued to improve its functionality in everyday environments. If you're thinking you'd like to purchase an ASIMO unit for your home or office, you're out of luck. At least for now, Honda is still not quite ready to put it on the market. The company says to make ASIMO ready for sale, it still has to fully understand how consumers would make use of it. With this information in hand, engineers will create the computer programs that will make Asimo the perfect home helper. They're also thinking of producing a series that could be used in dangerous rescue operations. In developing Asimo, the engineers have created some pretty cool spin-off technologies. Unicub is a single-seater vehicle that makes use of Asimo's balance control technology. 
Although Unicub is not yet for sale, it's currently on show at various venues around Japan, including event halls and art galleries. Unicub's most notable advantage is that both the user's hands remain free. Its mechanism incorporates one large wheel for forward motion and another smaller wheel for steering. When the user sits on a Unicub, the device remains upright, even if the user tilts their body or shifts their center of gravity. Unicub moves smoothly. All the rider has to do is to tip their body in the direction they want to go. This is a lot easier than I thought it would be. The device balances all by itself. I don't have to make an effort. And it's very intuitive. If I want to move forward, I simply move my weight forward. And it's very safe, so I'm not afraid of bumping into somebody because there's no machine between me and somebody else. And if I want to stop, very easy to do that too. The long years of developing ASIMO have produced a base of research knowledge on human mobility that engineers at Honda have harnessed to produce a walking assist device. An event to showcase the device was held at this medical center for the elderly. The strap-on machine works by using information from a hip joint angle sensor to determine the power supplied to the left and right motors. The motors activate struts that assist the wearer in lifting each leg when walking. The device helps people develop a longer, more rhythmical stride. It feels a little different wearing the device, as if someone is lifting your legs up for you. And the device guides your legs. It's easy to walk. The device is not only useful for the elderly and those undergoing rehabilitation, it also helps healthy people reduce the burden on their legs when, for example, mountain climbing the device will hit the market in the very near future. From science fiction to reality, Honda has built its reputation on taking incredible ideas and bringing them into our daily lives. ASIMO's acronym says it all. The name stands for Advanced Step in Innovative Mobility. And that's what Honda's all about. The reason that we continue research and development into humanoid robots is that at Honda, we believe that research into human behavior is extremely important and that knowing about that is the foundation of manufacturing our products. Researching humanoid robots has given us great technical knowledge and that is a major factor. We want to demonstrate how to use robots to show they can be useful in order to achieve commercialization. I think we can take the approach of selling a lot of robots so that, just like automobiles, the price will come down. We want to produce a robot that stimulates so much demand it will sell in large numbers. At some point, we hope robots will play an active role in society and that we can achieve the dream of human beings and robots living alongside each other. I hope you enjoyed the program. I'm Marc Carpentier. Thanks for watching and see you next time on another edition of JTEC Innovation and Evolution.